Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show, this is Tony and today on the show we will have John Little as a guest, John writes the Omega Shock blog and newsletter and remember you can find all of our A Minute to Midnight shows as audio downloads on our website and also as YouTube videos and iTunes audio as well, that's a minute to midnight.com so you can catch us at any of those places. We welcome back to the A Minute to Midnight show, John Little. It's been a while since you've been on the show, John, um, but it's great to have you back. Tony, it's, it is awesome to be here, especially with a show that has as much integrity as yours does. I am very impressed with the work that you guys are doing, and for me to be on this show, for you to ask me to come on this show is an incredible honor, and it really is. I take that very seriously. And I hope that and pray that you guys have many years of, of show broadcasts to come. And I hope that we continue with this. Now, it, and when Brooke reached out to me to come on the show, I don't think she quite realized what a fortuitous moment in time for us to be talking when so much is happening. And I believe, really, we have started a new chapter in the last days. And that's something that for my whole life, or for most of my life anyway, that has, I, I've been looking at this time and wondering about it. And I mean, I've been a Christian for something close to 43 years. I'm a pastor's kid, uh, grew up in Indiana in the 60s. I was always wondering what this moment in time would be like. And now we're sitting here. And I, and I, and as for those of you that are reading uh, Omega Shock, the the website that I'm writing, the articles that I write, you'll be you seeing more and more of what I'm saying is that it's one thing to have been looking at the things in the Bible as if it's some kind of theory, some theoretical, oh yes, the Bible is true, and yes, we accept that these things are happening, but it's another thing to actually see these things happening. And as we have reached the 50-year mark, the end of 50 years of Jewish control of Jerusalem, and as we watch this next group of events come rolling down upon us, I really want to uh, talk about those things because we're here, you and I and all, these, all the other people that are trying to warn the body of Christ, we're here because we're concerned about the spiritual safety of our brothers and sisters. And we're concerned about their physical safety. If I do not faithfully try and tell you what's coming because of the things that I see, I will one day stand before God and he will ask me, John, why didn't you say what you knew to say? And so my goal here is that in the, uh, in the next many minutes that we have here is to roll out a few of the things that, that I see happening so that as people can go and read their own Bibles. Remember, I'm just John Little, an Indiana boy born in the 60s. Um, I have one bit of my observations. You need to take everything that I say, that we say, to the Bible. And it really, that's really the thing that we all need to do. Let me go through just a quick over my bio because when you, you know, people you listen to some guy named John Little with a, an over tall guy with a last name like mine. Uh, and seriously, everybody says, no, you're, you're when I, when I'm living here in Taiwan, by the way, I'm just, I'm here in Taipei. I'm looking out kind of the cloudy skies. When I tell my, my students and, and some of the people I work with, and I tell them my last name is little, they look at me. I'm six foot four and a half, 194 centimeters. And they can't believe it. So anyway, let me just quickly go over my bio, and then we'll launch into some of the topics. I've been a Christian for 43 years. I'm a pastor's kid, born in the 60s, Indiana of all places, right in the middle, out in the middle of nowhere, corn cornfields, and just a lovely place to grow up, but nothing special. I'm a high school dropout with an MBA. I'm a I was a financial advisor and fund manager in the 1990s. I dropped out of that with. Well, it's, it's just really a horrible job being a finance guy. Um, and then became a professional writer for high-tech companies in Israel. Uh, I've had 22 years in Asia, 15 of those in Israel, and 
seven here in Taiwan. I speak and read Hebrew and do not read, uh, speak or read any Chinese. <laughs> and I'm as Jewish as a ham sandwich. <laughs> so if anyone wants to claim, and, and you know, my whole family, way back, I mean, generations back, we, we I'm sorry, if I get started on how awful my, my previous generations were, I mean, I love my family, but we have an interesting past. Um, and after Israel, Taiwan is my favorite country on the planet. I mean, it's really a wonderful place. So I invite anybody that's listening, if you've not been to Taiwan, you really don't know China. So, I mean, we really, anyway, so I it's just, I'm, I'm sorry, Taiwan's kind of close to my heart. And, and my wife and I, we teach uh, English classes uh, here in Taiwan. And, and the goal is this, we'll teach you English for free if you let us talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's our ministry here when I'm not writing for Omega Shock. Um, so, and then on April 5th, 2011, now this is the thing, I've been writing about geopolitics and Arab-Israeli conflict since the 1990s. I mean, this has been something I've been writing about for a long time. And then I theorized that, wait a second, you know, how could Iran do what they claim that they're being able to do? I mean, they really confidently claim that they can take out the United States, the great Satan. And I figured out that maybe they could do it with an EMP attack. And I wrote that in 2007. And then in 2011, I heard uh, an ex-Iranian Revolutionary Guard member talk about that that is exactly what Iran is planning to do. And that launched this, this moment in time in this period where I started to realize that there were things going on that I did not know about. And so here I am talking to you because of that moment in time where I saw things happening that I had not seen before. And then as I dug deeper, I saw the financial problems and I read this book called Aftershock and this is why I labeled the website Omega Shock uh -huh. because it's the final one that's coming. Yeah. It is coming. And when you have a financial viewpoint, you will see things if you dig deeply enough that will shock you. And of course, let's not forget that the the truly the alpha and omega is coming. We've had the alpha, the omega is coming. So um, now the thing is this, why did I spend 15 years in Israel? And this is germane to our conversation here. Um, Luke 21, 24 talks about the beginning of the last days, because when Jesus was speaking in, in Matthew 24, Mark 13 and Luke 21, he was talking about the last days. He basically gave a summary of all that was going to happen. And in Luke 21, 24, he talks about the fall of Jerusalem and then the return of Jerusalem. And that when, we, when Jerusalem returns to the Jews, he then went on to speak of the other things that were going to happen. And then in Matthew 24, he says the fateful words that really knocked me over. He said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And I want to tell you, I'm sorry, I'm 50. How much more time do we have? Now, Good um, and I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm I'm looking at the next twenty years of my life, and uh, I don't know how you, old you are, Tony. And frankly, it's not a, it's hey, a personal I'm a question. Child of the sixties as well. So. No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so look, you and I. I hate to say this, but I doubt that either of us are going to die of old age. No, probably not. But then the thing is, but okay, so Sometimes that's that. Sometimes I feel that, old enough to do that. <laughs> anyway, oh, don't yeah. get me don't get me started. I've got <laughs> I, I've got the aches and the aches and pains have begun yeah. as already. But then I mean, so that's good. Enough. That got me launched into Israel, interested in Israel, and I got you know I've got all this 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 military history background that I've been you know involved in, and and when I talk about how wars are fought and combat and things like that, it's a fascinating uh, process that is involved there. But then when I, I, you know, I don't know about you, but every time I would read through my Bible and I'd read about um, Ezekiel 38 and 39, what is that fire that rains down upon Gog and Magog and those who dwell carelessly in the isles? What is that? I mean, that was just fat. I mean, I had no idea what that was. Was it just, I don't know idea. And then I ran into Isaiah 30, and I know that we've talked about this previously in, in previous shows. But this is important 
Because when you read Isaiah 30, 26, it says the sun will be as light as the moon, or the moon shall be as light as the sun, and the sun will be as, as bright as seven days. When does that happen? It says when he heals the stroke of their wound and binds up the breach of his people. That's the salvation of Israel. So, and then I realized, wait, that's the fire that's raining down from heaven from God. And then I saw, wait a second, remember that thing about the EMP with, with Iran and all that? Whoa. I know what happens when an EMP happens. I mean, that's, that's the massive failure of, of civilization is going to be absolutely flattened. And that's the reason why I, I wrote Ezekiel's Fire and I finished. I started that writing that in 14, uh, 2014. It's finished. Please, everybody go to EzekielsFire.com. If you want to read my, you know, I, I've got, I post links all over the place. You can find it. It's free. Download it. It's not that bad. You know, I, I shortened the book. Those of you that I had to actually cut the book in half to make it easier to read. But okay, so as we're, as we move into this, we're now sitting at a moment in time where after Motegur on June 7th, 1967, spoke the fateful words that were heard around the world. In fact, my dad heard these words, well, in English, uh, as he was driving to his job on, in IU Medical uh, Center, as he, in his research, uh, in the research lab he was working at. Motegur said, the Hahara Bait Beyadenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands. Jerusalem was under control where now not every square inch of Jerusalem was under the authority of the state of Israel. Israeli law rules at every square centimeter in that place. If you go and commit a felony in the Temple Mount or any other place, you go before an Israeli judge, you're judged by Israeli law, and you go to an Israeli jail. I'm here in Taiwan. China claims control of Taiwan. If I uh, commit a felony here in, in Taiwan, I can claim that I did not violate you know, mainland Chinese law and I didn't commit a fel felony according to them, but a Taiwanese judge in a Taiwanese jail is not going to be sympathetic to that. Taiwan is ruled by Taiwan. So um, the thing is, is, as Trump came to Jerusalem last week, he failed. And how, how, how did he fail? It's also interesting he's been to Saudi Arabia as well, so that'll be another thing we can talk about. Okay, so what's your take on, um, on Trump's visit to Israel? There was, you know, successive presidents, I mean, uh, um, Republican presidents anyway, have all promised to bring the, the embassy to Jerusalem. In fact, I remember there's a place just off Der Hebron uh, where people point out this is where the embassy is supposed to go. There is a plot of land where that is prepared for the U.S. embassy. But every president has failed to live up to that promise. I don't know why. I'm not certain why. It doesn't make any sense to me. But they keep failing. And when Trump was going to go to the wall, I mean, they announced ahead of time that he was going to go to the Wailing Wall. And he was going to pray before that wall. He was going to he was going to visit that holy place. And when the prime minister of Israel offered to go with him to make it a state and official visit, they said, "No, no, Trump is going as himself. He's not going as the president of the United States. He's not entering the old city as the president of the United States. He entered the old city as Donald John Trump." And that's the thing that, that to me, when I sit there, when he failed, he failed to live up to those promises. He failed to make Jerusalem official in the eyes of the United States. He has, in, a, in his own way, rejected Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. By doing that, you have rejected Jerusalem. By doing that, you have Put yourself, he says, the Bible speaks of Jerusalem shall be a burdensome stone that shall crush all those that burden themselves with it. America, all the countries of the world have burdened themselves with this stone. And to this day, there is not a single embassy 
that resides in Jerusalem. They've all moved out. Those few, those few that that did acknowledge Jerusalem, there were uh, a cut near. There were embassies from South America that were that were there in Jerusalem. I'd drive by one every once in a while. And the point is, they've rejected Jerusalem for 50 years. The world had its opportunity to acknowledge Jerusalem, and, and 50 years is important because. For the first, you know, there's there's the there's the seventh year of release that happens in the Old Testament. By the way, when we we speak of the Old Testament, I know that some people say, well, we we live in the New Testament and whatever. But the Old Testament is a reflection of how God thinks. And even though I I I shrink from getting involved in numerology and study of numbers and things like that. You can get things wrong, and I have been wrong in the past, and I don't want to say, oh, well, I'm always right, and so therefore you should, you should listen to me. No, I'm not. You, you need to take this to the Bible. But the point is, 50 is important. 49 is seven you know, cycles of release, but then in Jubilee, the land returns to its rightful owners. The rightful owners. You've had 49 years to give the land back. But then after the 49 years, you don't have a choice anymore. You have to give it back. And then in the 50th year, which is the Shnat Yuval, the Jubilee, that, that Yuval, that Jerusalem, that Jubilee, that's where everything is set free. And that's where Jerusalem finally becomes, to my mind, to, my, to me, Jerusalem finally becomes truly, the, 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 the opportunity was finished. Jerusalem finally becomes that of Israel. And now, you know, if I didn't see all these other things that were happening, I might be able to take this as a more theoretical thing. Oh, you know, we'll take a wait and see. Maybe it's not such a big deal. But the problem is this. Gog and Magog is shaping up to happen. We are seeing things right now that we have never seen before. So we see things are happening in Syria. ISIS is failing. That I was just, you know, if you look at over the past few weeks, uh, the Syrian government, Russia, and Iran have been very successful in eroding ISIS control yeah, in that's, Syria. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, see, I was just reading today the the Russian military says its warships in the Mediterranean um, fired four cruise missiles at the Islamic State in Syria, um, and but, you know, basically did a lot of uh, damage in the city of uh, Palmyra. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it, but uh, 130 miles from Damascus, which is known as the Bride of the Desert. And, um, you know, that's a, a UNESCO heritage site. And uh, Russia's, you know, was, I think submarines in a warship it was, you know, done some serious damage to ISIS there. So, I mean, but Syria is a complete mess. Oh, it is a complete mess. But the, but here's the interesting part that I'm looking at. First of all, uh, we have the Kurds in the north. Now, both Isra Israel has been supportive of the Kurds for something like the last 20 years. Um, and there has been a lot of, you know, Israeli influence there for the Kurds. The Kurds want their own country. And the Kurds, and this is a, the interesting part of all this, the Kurds sit in the area that we would re normally refer to as Assyria. Okay, and there's a prophecy that, that Assyria will rise again. Now, 20% of Turkey is Kurdish, so the Turks are very afraid of the Kurds because if the Kurds rise up, they could take out a chunk of Turkey. They're in northern Syria, northern Iraq, and in northern Iran. So the point is, the Kurds are rising, and they're taking a piece of Syria. America is supporting the, the Kurds. The America is also supporting the quote unquote moderate rebels. And we have currently a situation where um, there's a base, there's a U.S. training base in uh, eastern Syria, sort of southeastern Syria near the border of Jordan. That, Syria, that base has been under threat from, uh, from the Iranians and the Syrians. And so the question is this, as America loses ground in Syria, you know, as, as ISIS fails and then the excuse for America to be involved in Syria falls, when that happens, what comes next? 
remember, we do not, you know, we have yet to see the destruction or the, as, as, as it says, when Syria, uh, I'm sorry, when Damascus is taken away as a city, and that's Isaiah chapter 17, that has never happened. That is coming. And we still, you know, Syria has still not been able to eliminate the pockets of resistance around Syria, Jobar. The, the thing and, is, is, you know, there are so many factions in Syria, and of course everyone's blaming everyone else. And I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, even and Putin has basically come out again in the last, uh, you know, few days or a week or whatever, and saying he doesn't believe that Assad and the, the Assad government was responsible for the chemical attack. Oh, this, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I agree with you completely. No, th- that, that, there's so much that's in that. I mean, it, it, it's, when something doesn't make sense, it means that there's, it's probably, there's, there's lying involved. Yeah. That was not a sarin gas attack. No. Because otherwise the people that were handling the, the, yeah. the bodies, handling the, the victims, they would have been uh, in the hospital as well. Yeah, and properly kitted up, not handling them with no gloves and, yeah, I mean, it was just, didn't look right. That's absolutely correct. And and so this, and now this is an example because the, the, the entire mainstream media jumped on this. And so this is an, an, an example of what we are having to deal with in terms of trying to figure out what actually is happening. Uh, so that does, that situation didn't make sense. And the, the thing that I'm concerned about, interesting, interested in, is I'm hearing more and more calls for the assassination of Assad. That's not a good thing. When If Assad is taken out, that means all the generals that have been supporting him, they start, well, they're the Alawite, I mean, all the generals that are, you know, all the officers in the Syrian army are all Alawite. Uh, the the Syria is ruled by a Shiite heret. It's actually put it this way: a heretical Shiite minority from the coast uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean of, on Syria. That Alawite minority, if the head of that Alawite minority is is assassinated, and if the person who tries to take his place, if he does, if he's not successful, Syria falls. So that so I'm 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 wondering if that's going to be ha- is that if that's in the cards, so, uh, Syria itself is prepared to fall apart. We have the Druze in the south. So along Israel's border, we have the Druze. We have the Syrian tribes. People don't realize that Syria is a very tribal country. If you if you want to control Syria, it's not through the ballot box. It's through the allegiance by the tribal leaders to your government. And right now, the tribes don't cooperate with each other, which is part of the reason why Syria has had some trouble fighting back against ISIS. The tribes don't trust each other. The thing is, uh, not fighting back against ISIS, ISIS is being funded from somewhere, somewhere being probably Turkey and the United States, I think. Uh, It would never have survived if there hadn't been external funding. Ah, see, you you understand. I'm sorry, I (laughs) can't... (laughs) <laughs> ah, sorry, I have this bad habit of doing that. Yeah. I apologize. We have there, there's something I, when uh, all all the books on counterterrorism that have been written, the best ones are written by Israelis. By the way, if you want to understand counterterrorism, read the books written by Israelis. If you want to understand terrorism, follow the money. Yeah. Without without you cannot have a revolution without money you cannot have terrorism without money you cannot have any kind of serious armed conflict without money where is the money coming from turkey and the gulf arabs yeah now america is 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 involved it's a little murky in terms of the details but people forget that isis is no different in terms of its methodology in terms of its psychology in terms of its logic, its rationale, its its interpretation of the Quran, it is exactly the same as Saudi Arabia. It is no different. Well, People that, are yeah. horrible. Sorry, so I, I mean that. Yeah, this is just leading, you know, somewhere. I'll just interrupt for a second. Go I, ahead. You know, I, I was the whole thing. I don't know if you saw Trump in Saudi Arabia and uh, and placing his hands on that orb. 
and the yes. um, the new global centre for combating extremist ideology. And what did Trump say? We must be united in pursuing the one goal that transcends over every other consideration. That goal is to meet history's greatest test, to conquer extremism and vanquish the forces of terrorism. And that's done in a in Saudi Arabia, for goodness sake, Saudi Arabia is the biggest <laughs> terrorist, uh, you know, extremist nation just about that there is. If I was writing fiction and I, I was saying stuff like that, they wouldn't believe it. I, I you know, it, it's it's too bizarre. I, it's like you sit there and you look at this and you go like, wow. Yeah. And, and, and here's the interesting thing is as we sit at the end of history, I mean, we're sitting at the end. We're looking back at all of this. It's not, it's not a mistake. It's not a, not a coincidence that Saudi Arabia is sitting on the, the, or did sit on the most, the largest, most vast pool of petrochemicals in the entire world. Oil is there for a reason. God put it there for the purpose of, taking the last days and making it really interesting. So it's a, a and, and I, I, I ponder all these things. And, and there's, and as I oftentimes tell my readers, I'm, I'm curious about all the reasons for all of this. And I'm looking forward to finding out, but I have to die first. <laughs> and I'm trying to avoid that for the moment. <laughs> so the, so the thing is, is as we watch, the American president go and, and do, I mean, okay, so he didn't overtly bow like Obama did. But, uh, you know, when that, when the king put that, that gold chain around his neck and, you know, and, and, and Trump had to kind of lower his head. I mean, that, that was, that was a lot like a, a lot like a bow. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just yeah. saying now. Okay. So, so that's okay. That's Saudi Arabia. That's ISIS. That's Syria. But there's a couple other things. And, and this, and I have been. I mean, I I'm, I've been pondering Gog and Magog for a long time. And and I'm 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 curious about the makeup of Gog and Magog. And the the two parts that I I could not really understand was Libya and Kush. Now Libya, I kind of understood. Okay, so you know that they're Muslim and, and they're whatever and. And now maybe somehow they'll be, you know, in alliance with Russia. Well, okay. Well, they are because right now there is, and, and this is, I, I created a new category in, in my, on my website called Gen, um, uh, Haftar, uh, no, 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 General Haftar, which is actually Khalifa Haftar, is the general that is in control of the eastern part of Libya, and he is steadily and surely taking over all of Libya. And who is supporting him? Russia. Also who is supporting him is Egypt because they're terrified of the Muslim Brotherhood. Who is on it, who, where is the mother, Muslim Brotherhood in Libya? On the western side, supported by Europe and the United States. So, and then also the Gulf Arabs are or at least one faction of the Gulf, Gulf Arabs is supporting Haftar. Haftar is winning. When he wins, he will have his allegiance with Russia. When Gog and Magog comes down, General Haftar will be a part of that. And then another thing occurred, and and uh, one reader of of, of Megashock um, offered a, a comment, and his name is Chris from Poland. Chris, well, his his last name will remain nameless, but he he shared something interesting. Now, when you say Kush, what is Kush? We oftentimes say Ethiopia, but it's more than just Ethiopia. There is one pocket in Sudan, but it's a minor pocket in Sudan. It's a minor pocket. There's Ethiopia, but there's another place, Somalia. The largest, Turkey right now is creating and is building the largest uh, foreign military base that it has ever created in Somalia. Oh, that's interesting. That's right. And so Turkey, as it tries to exert its own influence in the re region. And as it is being pushed out of the EU into the arms of Russia and into the arms of the competing, the CSTO, <clears throat> which is the uh, sort of the, 
the Russia, China, Central Asia equivalent of NATO. So Turkey is, is moving into the arms of Russia. They're trying to play – uh, Turkey is trying to play both sides against uh, – playing both sides off each, each other, but it's, it's not working. He's, Erdogan is, is going to be forced to, to give its allegiance to, to Russia. So as these players are coming, Somalia is going to be a part of it. Uh, and let us not forget Ethiopia. Ethiopia, that grand uh, Renaissance dam that they have been creating, is going to cut off water from the Nile. In fact, as it is stands right now, the Nile River, only 10% of the Nile River reaches the Mediterranean, wow. as it is right now. And of all the countries in the world, in terms of water consumption, the average Egyptian consumes pretty close to at the bottom of the list of countries that, that have enough water. The average Egyptian does not drink enough water, does not have enough water to drink, as it is right now, with just 10% of the Nile River reaching the Mediterranean. So when this dam finally becomes operational, or should I say, when the dam starts filling. Now, the Egyptians screwed up, and they screwed up for a couple of reasons. They screwed up because um, the United States supported the Muslim Brotherhood and, and helped overthrow Mubarak. Um, the wheat prices went up, and of course that caused Arab Spring in Egypt. So they were incapacitated, and when that happened, Ethiopia jumped in and started building that dam. They wanted to build it before, but Mubarak was too strong for them. So they started building that dam in 2011. That dam should be it should have been completed by now, but it will be completed this year. The reservoir will start filling. Now, Egypt wants uh, Ethiopia to spend the next seven to ten years filling that reservoir because they don't want the Nile to dry up. But I'm sorry. Ethiopia wants to sell electricity. They want that reservoir to fill as fast as possible. It's not, they're not going to take seven years to fill up that reservoir. And Ethiopia, I'm sorry, the government of Ethiopia is, is as corrupt as they come. So they're going to they, they're break any agreement that they make. And as it stands, it's a, it's, it's a done deal. And when Isaiah 19, what did Isaiah 19 say? It says that they will divert the brooks, the, the rivers that feed the Nile, and that the Nile will dry up. And it's happening right now. Wow, yeah. So, you know, the, these things are, are, are coming on in, into play. And then we're seeing the financial collapse. I, I just spent uh, yesterday, I was, I was listening to some of uh, the SRS Rocco, uh, yep. Steve St. Angelo. Yep. He's, he's an exceptional uh, observer of precious metals yep. and oil. And every... All the oil companies, well, at least the American oil companies, are failing. They're, they're losing money. The amount of debt that they are holding is incredible. And it's growing all the time. The question is this, when interest rates go up, and, and this debt, by the way, is, is junk rated. It's junk rated debt. So as they have to start paying off this debt, and as they are paying off this debt right now, uh, they're having to cut back on, on oil production. The, the profits, whatever operating profits they have, they don't have any profits, but whatever operating income they have is failing. When the financial collapse happens, the, the situation about peak oil will become clear because the only reason we've been, we've been able to maintain oil production at these levels is because of cheap debt. That's the only reason. And, it's, and right now, oil production is still falling. Peak oil happened in 2007. Hmm. Now, we've been able to use debt to, 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 uh, to invest in fracking. But fracking has not made any money for the oil companies. People who want to say, oh, yes, we, you know, oil for the next 200 years. Yeah, well, yeah, try to get it. The cost of oil extraction is beyond our economic and financial ability to extract. It's still there. Yeah. We just can't get it, at least not in a way that, that makes sense. So we're reaching, all of these things are happening as, as confidence in government is falling. 
as uh, uh, as our ability to maintain each other. Look at the anger and, and the frustration that is growing in Europe, United States. I don't know what it's like in New Zealand. Um, Not too bad or, here so far, but yeah. Which is good. Yeah. Um, and, and here in Taiwan, eh, well, we actually – we actually did have a situation with the um, the president of Taiwan that was elected, uh, Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, she was a response to the pop, you know, the average Taiwanese saying, "Hey, wait a second, we're tired of how the government does business here. We're throwing out the bums." So this idea of this resentment against government, this lack of confidence. Remember, the financial system is based on confidence. When confidence fails. The system fails. And so we, we're seeing a, a global problem with, with confidence. We're seeing South America failing uh, financial and economically. Um, and then, and, and I've been watching this, and, and if those of you that, that are curious about drama and about uh, corruption, what's going on in Washington, D.C., there's a guy named George Webb. He has been pulling at loose strings. He's been trying to figure out what's going on. And he's under threat. It's, it's, it's fascinating to watch what he because he, he does these reports every day, multiple times a day. And he's tracking down the, the corrupt Hillary's corruption. He's tracking down uh, child sex trafficking. He's tracking down the murder of Seth Rich. We have not received a clear report from the Washington, D.C. police of how Seth Rich was murdered who murdered him, and how he died. We do not have an autopsy report. We, there are so many questions about how Seth Rich died and the fact that he was probably, in fact, no, not, well, okay, very strong probability that he was the one who leaked all the documents from the, from the Democratic National uh, DNC, the Democrat National Congress or Whatever. Yeah. Anyway, the leadership of the of the Democrats. Yeah. So, you know, and of course, and and, and the politicians in Washington D.C. are terrified of what is going. What, you know, these revelations, they are terrified. They're terrified of Hillary. Hillary is a <laughs> Hillary is a dangerous character. Yeah. And what is connected to that? And this 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 gets me. This really gets me angry. What's connected to that? is heroin. The heroin production, I mean, I have, a, I have relatives, I have a couple of relatives that were caught in heroin addiction. And Lord willing, um, they will be free. But uh, as, a, as one friend of mine here in Taiwan, one of the reasons why he loves Taiwan is it's so hard to get heroin here in Taiwan because he was an addict. The heroin production, uh, the center of heroin production is, is Afghanistan. The vast majority, if you add up all outside of Afghanistan, if you add up all the other countries that produce heroin, you add it all up, it doesn't even reach half of Afghanistan's production. And heroin is an easy uh, plant. I mean, the opium poppy is an easy plant, easy flower to, to see from the air. All you have to do is fly over the fields when the opium poppy is flowering how difficult would it be if you control the airspace to actually spray those opium poppies? After all, we have Monsanto and Roundup. <laughs> okay? And where and who's bringing in all the heroin? This, this, you know, we speak of heroin addiction as, as an epidemic. It's coming from Afghanistan. Who's bringing it in? Yeah. Why are why is it so hard for people not to connect the dots? I don't under I mean I, and I, my head is exploding over this because it, it is an it is a truly evil thing. The only time in history that even comes close to this was when the British were uh, trading heroin for tea with the Chinese. They were forcing the Chinese to to buy their the not it wasn't heroin it was opium at the time. Yeah, the opium wars. Yeah. I mean, that's the only other parallel that we have in history. America is the largest heroin dealer in the world. And speaking as an American who, I mean, my family has centuries 
I mean, we uh, the first John Little to 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 fall in battle fell a couple days after Washington's crossing of the Delaware. My family has a history of patriotism and and fighting and dying for America's wars. We have been in every war that America has ever fought, including Iraq and Afghanistan. And to think that my family, that 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 we Americans are the biggest drug dealers on the planet. That is almost too much. I, 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 I almost can't take it. And you've got to, you know, put two and two together. And what? Why did why did America go to Afghanistan to chase some right. guy, some guy in a cave, who supposedly <laughs> ma- masterminded, you know, something on the other side of the world from what? You know, a, right? A, a pocket pocket watch or what? <laughs> Cell phone? <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, you know, no, it's an excuse to get into Afghanistan. That's right, and, and and an excuse to to sell to grow and sell heroin. So I mean that's the only now unless someone can come forward and say, oh well, John, it's you know Afghanistan has got has got what I, I no one has come to me and said what Afghanistan has has outside of heroin. Okay, so we've got that, and so what comes next? Because as the corruption is uncovered in Washington D.C., as things fail, as confidence fails. What does what do politicians do when they feel under threat? They go to war. Yeah. And that's the that's the thing that I worry about because now I'm sitting I'm saying about five or six thousand miles south of, of North Korea. Is war gonna break out in North Korea? I don't know. Yeah. Is well, is the center of war gonna be in the Middle East? I don't know. But war is coming. And you go, I mean, all wars are bankers' wars too. Ultimately, aren't they? It's you know, it all well, comes down to the yeah. funding and the banking and the banking system. Well, that, that in, and of course, you bring up a, a very sore point because uh, the CIA was was created by Wall Street. Yeah, and uh, the the Wall Street that's just terrible. I mean, some of the stories that you hear about what CIA CIA agents can do by just walking into a bank and saying, you know. Here's who I am. Here's what this. Give me a million dollars, and they do. Uh, that was that came out of um, what's his face, the helicopter helicopter pilot that uh, flew in Vietnam and then in Central America. Um, he has a whole dossier, and and uh, he survived barely. So as we watch George Webb track down the corruption, the heroin, the murders, the the su- child sex trafficking, the blackmailing of U.S. politicians. The involvement of the CIA and the NSA, and and uh, and who knows what might be happening with the Pentagon. You know, we're going to see possibly the unraveling of America, or at least the American political system in Washington D.C. So, uh, so where do we o- go from the here? The other thing besides war, of course, is was we, takes us back to sort of where we were at the beginning, and that's terrorism, and and like Donald Trump. We, in Saudi Arabia and this whole, right. you know, global thing for combating terrorism. And, yeah, now we have these, like, attacks in Manchester and things, and suddenly terrorism is placed in this right at the centre of being the most important thing again uh, so that they can have more, set more rules into place, basically, to curb freedoms and, and you know, and, and then if, you know, if everything's falling apart, then creating some big false flag attack, some huge thing potentially, could be used to galvanize everyone into a war. That is. I, I don't, it, it's, no, okay, and, and this is where as you uh, try to unravel all the different strands that are just sort of woven tightly together. First of all, we have the invasion of uh, Europe by all these migrants and it's being fueled by some pretty heinous people. We're talking about George Soros and, and, and his NGOs. We've talked about all these other NGOs. Muslims are invading Europe. And they're also invading the United States, but, but not quite as quickly because it's a little harder to get to the United States than, than Europe. So why is that happening? Now, for me, I see it as a, a fulfillment of prophecy from Matthew 24-7. What is Matthew 24, 7? It says ethnos will rise up against ethnos. It says nation, but it's ethnos. Yeah. 
And so each ethnic group is rising up. It, it, ethnic groups are going to be rising up and killing each other. Well, uh, Islam is an ethnic group, group all by itself. And the Muslims are coming in and, and destroying each other. And, and of course, by the way, what's, what's, what's the moment? You know, what is that the holy month that we're in right now, according to Islam? Ramadan. Ramadan. Yeah. Which can, oh, I just want to bring up something else here again. You know, going back, we talked about Egypt, and it actually ties in with all of this. don't know if you heard about the massacre of 29 Coptic Christians in, in Egypt where the Islamists, ISIS or whatever, marched them off a bus one by one, asking them to deny their faith in Jesus Christ. And every single one of them, including the children, all refused to renounce their faith faith, and um, claim to be Islamic. And they they basically killed a lot of them, a bullet to the head or a bullet to the throat. Uh, right. And that, that's, you know, that's in Egypt. And... Um, and that's ISIS, it's Islam, it's, it's kind of off the track, but ha- how long till Christians in the West face the same sort of thing, you know, deny your faith or be yeah. killed? Well, I mean, that's the thing, and, and, and as I tell people, and, and by the way, just as a, as a side note, when the the Egyptians, when they look at, I mean, we're, we're seeing Egyptians, I mean, they're one of the most powerful, the most well-known broadcasters in Egypt. Um, he runs a television program that, that Egypt, all the Egyptians watch. He was brought to tears over the willingness of the Coptic Christians to sacrifice their lives for their faith. I mean, it's just amazing to watch. I mean, these Christians in Egypt, as they die for Christ and are willing to die for Christ, it's leaving an impact on Egypt. We'll see this as we as we go along. But um, the thing that I that concerns me greatly and and. Uh, as I have been coming up against this this incredible ignorance among our brothers and sisters in Christ, how little they know about what's actually happening and why it's happening. You know, I, 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 I stress of all the things you can do, please read your Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Don't leave anything out. The Old Testament is where we get most of what we know about the last days. And of course, as we talk about the last days, please, your understanding must start with the words of Jesus, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. If it's not there, if it's not in the Old Testament in Revelation, please don't add to the Bible. Just take the Bible as it says. It's not. Anyway, sorry, I I have to be careful. There's so many people that are adding all these things, and I'm running into all these incredible um, just heresies that are rising up. I had some guy who's who's he believes in the Bantu God, oh, yeah, God of the Bantu. <laughs> yeah. I know. I mean, he, he's actually he's, he's in Texas, and he keeps trying to 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 tell me how how wrong I am, how wrong the Christians are, and that all the Jews were Bantus or some sort of thing. The, the point is, heresies are increasing. Yeah. You must, you must be reading your Bible and thinking critically. Where's, where's our critical thought? Well, it's, it's like, as all these bombings that are happening and, and the murders from Muslims, where's the critical thought? Why aren't people sitting down and saying, well, now, wait a second. Every, you know, it's like not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists tend to be Muslims. Mm. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah. And I recommend to everybody, uh, Acts 17 Apologetics, David Wood. What an incredible, and humorous. I mean, his, his videos are funny. He's great videos on the, the incredible insanity of not thinking critically about Islam and the reasons why there's so much violence in our world today. Mm. Uh, we're going to see more of this. This is we, we have just scratched the surface. And as Christianity fails, as as the abortion rate in our churches increase, as the pornography use in our churches increase, as the fail you know as our as our failure to preserve our marriages in our churches increase. We're going to start seeing more and more heresies into our churches, the white nationalism, the nationalisms that are coming. I don't know what it is about skin tone, 
but I don't consider it to be a very intelligent idea. No. So the all these things are rising up. And as I'm I've been battling anti-Semites for 20 years, and it's growing at an exponential rate. I don't understand why this is. It's almost as if 12 million Jews are so incredibly powerful. What, what is it about these, these this, this small group of Jewish people that is so incredible? What? No, I'm sorry. Uh, we're the morons. We're all of us. We, we, we did this to ourselves. We have, what was it uh, I was writing just the other day? And by the way, as we... If we're getting close to time, tell me to shut up. I tell everybody, uh, by the way. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, John. Um, w- w- would you like to carry on and, and, and do a second show? Sure, sure. Okay, so how about, how about we do the, uh, we, um, we close this one off and then get on to this because there's a few things I'd like to actually bring up to do with sure. the whole Israel and the Jewish thing. And, and, um, and, le- and let's, call that, let's call that a second show, so... Um, folks, we'll close off this, um, and thank you, John, for being on this first show, and we will we'll get on and record a second one. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Well, folks, we'll have a second show with John Little, hopefully up a couple or three days after this one, and you'll find all of our shows at a minute to midnight.com where we keep archives of all of our shows which we put out on YouTube and iTunes as well. And A Minute to Midnight is run entirely by donations. Uh, There's a small group of people that donate, and I want to say thank you to those people that do support us. We couldn't do this without you, so thank you. And I think that's about it for this show, apart from I just, that's right, I, I write, play, and record all the music. Mustn't forget that. That um, is used in our shows and you can find my music at rockshoresounds.com and there's a link to that on the A Minute to Midnight website as well. So that's about it for today's show. We'll catch you in the next episode of the A Minute to Midnight show. So this is Tony signing off until then. Music